And you don't seem to understand A shame you seemed an honest man And all the fears you hold so dear Will turn to whisper in your ear And you know what they say I hurt you And you know that it means so much And you don't even feel a thing One of the most important and ongoing developments for the human race is our ability in storing and retrieving information. All other scientific and cultural advancements are meaningless if they cannot be kept and communicated. From the creation of languages which allowed information to be passed from person to person, then to visual mediums like cave paintings, which presented information in a more permanent form that could be accessed and understood by many people. This turned into written language, allowing for more complex information. Scrolls and later books allowed for mobility. You no longer had to go to a specific cave. The library was invented. Then came mass production of these written words via the printing press, increasing the breadth of people who could access this information and the speed in which it was spread. People became connected by roads, allowing for proper mail service. We created wires, allowing for telegraph and the telephone. We learned how to transmit information through the air with radio and television. And now we sit at home watching some dorky guy talk about anime on the internet. Now the internet as we know it began development in the 1960s as a means of connecting physical networks into a larger logical network. But the idea of informational networks completely separated from the internet goes back even further. In 1945, engineer Vannevar Bush proposed the idea of a device that could compress and store information through the use of microfilm, where information could be interconnected through hypertext and access at speeds far greater than using physical copies. Says Bush, Presumably man's spirit should be elevated if he can better review his shady past and analyze more completely and objectively his present problems. The internet can be said to do the same, to keep more and more perfect records of our humanity. The problem is that human nature isn't really all that logical, and where this logical systems and our human nature interacts is the playground for serial experiments laid, a 13 episode anime that aired in Japan in 1998. Through a series of seemingly at first unconnected vignettes, we follow a 14-year-old girl named Lane as she discovers a hidden culture of the internet-like technology called The Wire, as well as discovering shocking things about herself. Serial Experiments Lane is a complex beast, a very text-heavy piece about our relationship with the internet that actually seems more relevant today than it was in 1998. It's paced like a horror story and rewards multiple viewings. Out of all the art house animes, it's arguably the biggest hit for Western audiences. I think only Paranoia Agent really challenges that. As goes with the territory, there are claims of it being pretentious, but I find the series to be right on the money with its text and subtext, even as it delves into more abstract and theological concepts. Speaking of, this is episode 4, Religion. Almost all the episodes start with the same segment of people walking along busy city streets, only with a different narration. This time, a girl expresses how humans are all alone, not connected in any meaningful way. This is seemingly countered with a shot of power lines, the show's ongoing symbol for the wired, complete with an electrical hum resonating into our world. Cut to Lane, all alone in a room, working on modifying her computer. Since acquiring something called a Psyche processor, her computer and Lane's knowledge of computers has been growing at an alarming rate. It looks complicated now, but eventually it'll become a half-flooded temple of processing towers, projectors, and hydraulics. Lane's father watches from the door, seemingly disconnected and a bit sad at Lane's new hobby. This seems odd. As we were first introduced to this character doing similar modifications with a childlike giddiness. Lane's family are worried about these recent developments, but seem unable to properly communicate this with each other. Lane's sister is chastised for bringing it up, and when dad confirms Lane's odd behavior to mom, it calls for a loving embrace.
And can you feel the love tonight? Elsewhere, some guy is running around, scared completely shitless. That kind of scared where you can't even seem to perform simple tasks like putting a key into a lock. Seriously, this guy keeps at it for like 50 seconds and never manages to get it into the door. You have to think he picked the wrong apartment in his panic or something, because otherwise, well, he's kind of an idiot. We discover his pursuer is well, just a little girl with a stuffed dog. Gotcha. The next day, kids at school are discussing a recent suicide of a student. It's implied, though never outright confirmed, that this kid was the one we just watched getting completely confused by the concept of keys. Suicide is a constant occurrence in this show. The first episode opens with the girl throwing herself off a roof. The second ends with the boy shooting himself in the head. All of these deaths are in some way connected to the Wired, and they seem to be drawing Lane into the Wired. Lane seems to have a better understanding of these events than the classmates she hangs out with, which surprises the hell out of them. Lane never seemed interested in gossip like this. Lane is an interesting protagonist in that she does most of the important stuff off camera, and a lot of the show is trying to figure out just how much she knows and to what degree she's involved with things. Lane explains she's been following up on these things in The Wired. We take it for granted now, but once upon a time, news, even personal news among friends, didn't travel instantaneously. Lane's classmates are only casually involved with The Wire, but Lane is ingrained in it. She explains that this and a number of other suicides appear to be connected to an online game. We then encounter the creepy girl from before, only she's not so creepy now. We're back in Lane's room. Questions abound. What is she doing? Where is she getting all this stuff? Right now she seems to be in detective mode, going about asking people about this game causing all these suicides, including her lead informant DJ Welder Goggles. We learn that the game is called Phantoma, which we see in action, kind of, as another terrified kid runs around on the rooftop of another apartment complex. This time it's intercut with game footage, a low res brick maze. It's clear that, even though he's nowhere near a computer, this guy is still somehow connected to the game. And now he's being chased by Lane. What's Lane doing there? It's probable that she's investigating the game by entering it, and since Phantoma is a horror-themed game, and looks a little bit like an ancestor to Amnesia the Dark Descent, any presence in the game is going to be registered as a hostile enemy. The kid makes a run for it, but soon finds himself cornered by another little girl. The kid pulls out an invisible gun and defends himself, only to realize that he just murdered a real girl. Kind of. Maybe. Because of this scene's ambiguity, it's one of the most haunting moments in the entire series. The kid is convinced he just killed someone, but all we see is a bundle of sheets that the dead kid might be under. There are so many questions. Was the gun invisible because it was part of the game, or because it was a real gun that didn't translate into the game world? We don't ever see a visible gun. And if it was real, then why was this guy carrying it around with him? But if it's not real, then why does this girl's face suddenly turn to that of dying shock? If the girl is really there, what exactly is she doing on the roof? 
Why is there a wall of glowing hands? Why is Fantoma seemingly bleeding into the real world like this? And why does Lane appear in the real world after Fantoma has vanished? We do learn why little girls keep popping up in Fantoma. Through an unseen bug, the game ends up integrating itself with an online tag game, resulting in this bizarre fusion. The players saw these little girls as enemies in the game, while the little girls saw them as players to catch and tag. So why did the first girl have such a deep and creepy voice? Well, we see the girl later with a normal little girl voice. She's walking around town with her mother. Now, from my personal experiences, kids at around kindergarten age just aren't as capable of video games as even slightly older children. I couldn't do a damn thing in Super Mario Brothers when I was five, but I was actually pretty good by the time I was seven. I think it's actually very likely that this girl's mother was actually helping the girl play the game, and that the voice we hear is that of the mother's, causing that unnerving disconnect. All of this plays to the idea of combining two seemingly unrelated things and producing an unexpected result. An adult playing a kid's game results in a creepy horror monster. A horror game and a kindergarten game results in its own unique thing running amok. And in the larger scheme of things, the real world interacting with the conceptual world of the Wired is having unexpected results. Lane has now been an eyewitness to this very thing. And when her dad shows up and warns her not to confuse the Wired with the real world, Lane just smiles and tells him he's wrong. She knows better now. That just leaves the two creepy guys in black outside her house. They have been hanging around for a while, watching her through weird sci-fi goggles with laser pointers. Lane is frankly getting tired of these guys and suddenly displays power in the real world. Ow, those were prescription sci-fi goggles, you jerk! This is only a snapshot of what's actually a multimedia art piece. On top of the anime, there's a prequel manga, an art book, and a video game where you get to interact with Lane's computer and learn more about the setting. There's a lot of angles to approach this work, a lot of different themes and concepts being explored here. But is Serial Experiments Lane good? Well, obviously, if you have no tolerance for more artistically driven and abstract pieces like this, you know, if you're, say, Confused Matthew, then, you know, don't bother. But for this kind of thing, I think it's really engaging and well done. It's not an anime that really pops at you, you know, actions and character models are kept pretty simple, using things as basic as an asymmetrical haircut to cause an unease in Lane's character. The soundtrack is equally understated. Its horror film pacing is remarkably effective for something like this. It's the kind of show that is more fun to discuss on message boards and blog posts as you watch it. So yeah, you know, it's good. It, it is really good, and I recommend it. Go watch Serial Experiments Lane. Go. Shoot. Get out of here. Get off my lawn. Log out. <laughs>